invite you to take a copy of the Bible and open up to the book of Mark. As we're continuing to make our way through Mark's gospel. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10 today. Mark chapter 10. So Mark today, as we come to the end of chapter 10, is actually going to give us a glimpse of the end of Jesus' public ministry. As we've mentioned over the last several weeks, as we've worked our way through chapters 9 and 10, Jesus is making his way toward Jerusalem where the events of his death and his resurrection, what we understand to be the Easter story, is going to take place. And as we're going to look at this passage today, we're going to see Jesus ask a question. It's not a new question. It's a question that we've seen him ask before. But before we look at it, I want us to just think for a moment about the important questions that we ask in life, or at least that maybe we ask ourselves. And there's a lot of questions that we have to answer when we think about the direction of our lives and even in the shaping of our worldview. What are my goals in life? What do, I want to, what do I want to do in order to achieve them? We can even get a little bit deeper. What's the meaning of life? Why am I here? All of these are important. And all of these have far-reaching consequences and far-reaching implications depending on how we answer them. Yet the question today that we're going to hear, we're going to hear Jesus ask, what do you want me to do for you? So friends, I ask you today, and I'll ask it again in a few moments, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Have you ever pondered how you would answer that question if Jesus stood in front of you in person and asked you that question? And today we'll get a chance to look at how one blind man answered this question and what happened as a result. So if you've got your place in Mark 10, and I'll ask you to stand with me as we read our passage, we're going to be in Mark 10 Verse 46 is where we're starting. Mark 10, 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the story of Bartimaeus. We thank you, Father, for the power that we see in your son Jesus, Lord, the power to give mercy, the power to heal. And Father, we thank you that you still give, you still heal, that you still give mercy even today, Father. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand what's happening here, what's taking place here. We pray, Lord, that we would admit, Lord, and see the areas where we need mercy, where we need healing. And Father, that we would admit, God, that we are all blind and need you to heal our blindness. Father, we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So our main idea of the sermon today is that God mercifully heals our spiritual blindness through Jesus Christ. God mercifully heals our spiritual blindness through Jesus Christ. So the first thing we're going to see in this text, right, I think we see is Bartimaeus, a man in need of mercy. We see Bartimaeus, a man in need of mercy. Look at verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. So they, they, there's this crowd that is around Jesus, and they're on their way to Jerusalem. Likely it's other pilgrims. As we're approaching Passover, many of them are on their way to Jerusalem to observe Passover. And Jerusalem, or rather Jericho, lies on a popular route to, to Jerusalem. So it's not unlikely that there would be a lot of people on this road passing through Jericho on this way. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all in their Gospels, give us an account of this healing taking place. Although there are differences that we see in each of the Gospels. In Matthew's Gospel, he mentions that there are two blind men that happen to be here. Although Mark only chooses to focus on one. And in this, we have Bartimaeus, whose name means son of Timaeus. So in the other places in the gospel, sometimes we see the phrase Simon bar Jonah, which means Simon, son of Jonah. It's a similar type phrase here. 
And we see that he's reduced to begging because he's blind. But he's also ostracized out of society because he is blind, because the Jews believed that blindness was a curse for sin. In other words, it was a punishment. And this is clear when we read in John 9, when the disciples, when they are encountering another person that's blind, the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents that led to him becoming blind? And of course, because he's blind, he has to re rely on his other senses, in this case, his sense of hearing, and he hears that Jesus is coming by. And look what happens in verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. And he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Bartimaeus has heard all of the things that Jesus has done for others. He's heard of the things that he is capable of. And he's not going to let this opportunity to have an encounter with Jesus and receive what he needs from Jesus. He's not going to let that pass by. So he cries out for him, yelling for him. And look at how he identifies him. Look at the name that he gives him. Seems like Bartimaeus knows his Old Testament and recognizes who Jesus is beyond just being this person who happens to be from Nazareth. He calls him son of David. Now, God made a covenant with David, which we see back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God said he would raise up a member of David's family who would be both a son to David and a son to God. And God said that he would establish the son of David and son of God, establish his throne forever. Jeremiah, the prophet, also spoke of him in Jeremiah 23, where he said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, wherein I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as a king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Bartimaeus recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the son of David that God had promised. But here's the rub. He is taking a risk in identifying him as the son of David. In John 9, 22, John tells us that the religious authorities had made it illegal to identify Jesus as the Messiah. And if you identify Jesus as the Messiah, you are no longer allowed to worship in the synagogue. So Bartimaeus is taking a risk here saying, here comes the Messiah, here comes the son of David. Risk being kicked out of the synagogue permanently. But hey, he's blind on the side of the road. What more does he have to lose really? And he recognizes that Jesus is the one who can provide and meet his biggest need. Now notice, he doesn't say, come heal my eyes. He says, I need mercy. Be merciful toward me. So what does he mean? If we were to try to give a definition of mercy, what exactly is he asking for? Now mercy means relief from suffering. It means relief from some type of suffering in a broad general sense. So it's why we often call ministries of mercy, those ministries that provide food or might provide medicine or might provide something that meets someone's need. Now, in the biblical sense, and even in a legal sense, mercy has a little bit more of a specific meaning. I think what we're seeing here is both of these. But mercy also more specifically means it's relief from suffering given by someone who has the right to punish So Bartimaeus is asking for mercy. He's asking for relief from his blindness. But as we'll see in a few moments, he's also asking for relief from spiritual blindness. He's asking for spiritual mercy. Now, let me kind of illustrate it this way. Let's imagine that you have broken some type of law and you are taken into court. Then you are put before the judge and the judge has the right to punish you because of this crime that you've committed and because of this law that you have broken. And instead of punishing you, the judge says, you know what? You deserve this punishment, but I'm not going to punish you. In that moment, he is showing you mercy. He's giving you mercy. He's withholding something that you deserve. Relieving you from some type of suffering that you would have to have had to endure. 
And the Bible shows us that mercy or being merciful is one of God's attributes and one of his characteristics. The Bible is full of descriptions of how God has shown and continues to show mercy. In Ephesians 4, Paul says that God is rich in mercy. But what about the Old Testament? The Old Testament we hear so often is the God of the Old Testament is mean and he's angry and he's wrathful. And yes, God has those characteristics and we see them on display in the Old Testament. But listen to how Moses describes him in Exodus 34. It says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, and he proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He showed mercy to Israel many times in providing food for them in the wilderness and showed them mercy by entering into a covenant. The verse that we just read took place after Israel had created a golden calf to worship and rather than destroy them, he shows them mercy. Now, because of our sin, which offends and angers God, because we have broken his law, he has the right to punish us. His perfect justice requires that he punish someone. It requires that he punishes lawbreakers. And the punishment is death and eternal separation. Yet God has chosen to give and show us mercy in his son, Jesus Christ, the son of David, who Bartimaeus has just identified. And in Jesus' death and resurrection is how he shows us this mercy, pouring out punishment on Jesus Yet he's shown us more than just mercy. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In addition to showing us mercy, he has also given us and shown us grace. He has regenerated us, has allowed us to be born again. Not only has he withheld punishment, but he has regenerated us, causing us to be a new creation. So what's the difference? Grace is related to mercy, but it's different. If mercy is withholding something we deserve, relieving us of something, then grace is giving us something we do not deserve. It means giving us a gift that we have done nothing to earn. It means we've done nothing to deserve it. So while mercy and grace are related, they are different. And like Bartimaeus, we have to cry out for Jesus' mercy. Paul says in Romans 10, 13, that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So we have to admit to God our need for his mercy and need for forgiveness before we can receive it. So the biggest obstacle to receiving God's mercy then is often pride. It's why Jesus, in his parable, when the man is praying, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this person who's a sinner. We often do that. I'm not like that guy. Maybe I've, I've, I've told a few lies or maybe I've fudged some things, but I've never murdered anyone. That's pride, friends. We have to be like the other man in the parable who says, God, have mercy on me, a wretched sinner. Mercy won't mean anything until we understand why we need it. So how does God respond to our cries for mercy? That's what we see next, where we see Jesus, a compassionate king. We've seen Bartimaeus, who is in need of mercy. And next we see Jesus, a compassionate king. Look back at verse 49. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. So Jesus, who is busy, he's on the way to Jerusalem to do something very important that's got historical and cosmic consequences. But yet he stops to see what it is that Bartimaeus needs, this blind beggar on the side of the road. And this crowd who we just saw, who was indifferent and angry at this blind man who would dare speak to Jesus, now all of a sudden they're like, hey, hey, come, come. He's calling you. Be encouraged. Be happy. Kind of shows the fickleness of a crowd. Well, if Jesus wants to talk to this guy, then he must be important too. Now, the new draft pick, Victor Vuebenyama, who's the number one draft pick of the NBA from the San Antonio Spurs, got in a little bit of a dust-up a couple weeks ago with his entourage. See, he was walking, and then someone, another celebrity, came up and tapped him on the shoulder, and it led to some kind of altercation. See, people who are high up, have high power, high influence, they don't want to be bothered. Now, I admit, there are security risks. There's reason that they have people around them. But Jesus is different. 
He's a king who has made time to be amongst the lowly. He has a compassion for those who need him. Remember the story of Esther, how she had to go and approach the king. Esther went before the king, risking her life. And in God's providence, the king extended his scepter, which means that she could come and speak to him. And Jesus, who is more glorious and more royal than any king on earth, and any king in history, answers the call and the cry of this beggar and says, bring him here. And in verse 50, it says, And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? So Bartimaeus responds to this cry or, or to this beckon immediately, jumps up. And it's interesting to me. Okay, this guy's blind, and, but it mentions nobody helping him and goes right toward Jesus. I just find that interesting. Now, Jesus is a smart man. It probably wouldn't take much to understand what this guy needs. It would be pretty obvious that Bartimaeus can't see. And it's pretty obvious what it is that Jesus needs to do for him. He's already cried out and asked for mercy. So why is it then that Jesus even asks this question? Is he insulting him? Is he on an ego trip? It's because Jesus wants to hear Bartimaeus and wants to hear us in turn ask and share what it is that we need. Jesus himself says in Matthew that the Father knows what we need even before we ask. But to verbalize our needs, to verbalize what it is that we need Jesus to do causes us to recognize our total and utter dependence upon him. It's meant to humble us. And Jesus wants us to share exactly what it is that we need. Now, as a matter of application, I think it's appropriate for times for us to pray silently, that there are moments when we might need to pray silently given whatever circumstances are around. But I want to encourage you that as often as you can, when you pray, pray aloud. Pray verbally when you're in times of devotion, when you're doing your quiet times. It helps keep us focused. I think it helps keep our minds from wondering if you're speaking verbally. If you're praying silently in your mind, in my experience, that's when my mind begins to wonder. But also, I think it's important for us to express verbally and confirm our faith that God can grant the request and grant the things that we are asking for. It's not a work that we'll get rewarded for, but it reminds us that the person that we are talking to is real and hears us. Now, the question that he asked, what do you want me to do for you, should sound familiar. It's because we heard it last week. It's the same question that Jesus asked James and John. But James and John were after glory, but not Bartimaeus. Look what he says. And it says, And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Bartimaeus asked the king of all creation, not for glory, not for position. He asks him for mercy. He asks him for him to restore his sight, to be relieved of this blight that is on him. He wants to be able to see, and he gives Jesus his request with confidence and full belief that Jesus can heal him. So friends, I ask in the introduction, but I'll ask it again. How would you answer the question? If Jesus asked you, what do you want me to do for you? How would you answer or how would you respond? And how we answer that question is going to reveal the nature of our heart and the nature of our desires. Now, first of all, our answer should always be that of like Bartimaeus. Lord, I need your mercy. I need you to save me. But what do we do beyond that as followers of Christ? We ought to pray for physical and spiritual things. I don't mean to make this any harder than it needs to be. Certainly not just anything to be ashamed of. There are things that we can pray for. It doesn't have to be, you know, things that we think we should pray for because we want to be more spiritual. But we should pray for the fierce physical and spiritual needs that we have. Pray for our physical needs. That's what Jesus did when he taught the disciples how to pray. What did he say? Give us, Lord, our daily bread. So it's okay to pray for physical needs. It's okay to pray for healing. We also need to pray for spiritual things. 
If there are people we know that need to know Jesus, let's pray for their salvation. We know that God wants us to be more like Jesus. So we should pray for our sanctification. And like Bartimaeus, be specific in what we pray for. Praying according to God's will doesn't have to be vague and it doesn't have to be kind of ethereal. If there is a specific need or a specific thing that you desire, pray for that specific thing. That's exactly what Bartimaeus does here. He doesn't say, Lord, heal me. He says, restore my sight. Help me recover my sight. And in Jesus, we have a king who wants us to approach him. Many of us have probably seen the Wizard of Oz. If you remember at the, when, they, when the Dorothy and all the others, they come to the wizard, they're kind of in this fearful kind of state. They approach this big green head with, with trepidation. And what does he do? He, before he even grants their request, he gives them this list of tasks that they have to accomplish. Jesus is not that kind of king. He is one who's done the task, the only task that is required for us to approach him and going to the cross. And now we can go to him with confidence. Reverence, yes, but also confidence. As the writer of Hebrews says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We have access to a compassionate, loving king who identifies with our needs, who when we needed mercy came to us. So let's go to him in confidence. So if you need his mercy, if you need his grace, or if you have need of him, ask him for it. And let's receive what comes next, which is a healing that comes through faith. Next, what we see take place is a healing that comes through faith. Look at verse 52. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, Matthew's account tells us that Jesus touched the man's eyes and they were healed. There was a miracle taking place and this man is given sight. Now, think for just a moment about how complex the human eye is. It's said that the the human eye is second in complexity or the second most complex organ in the human body next only to the brain. There's lots of examples that we could use. But one of the things that we see as technology now that's becoming popular is retina scanning. We see it in movies a lot where, you know, you're identified uh, by them scanning your retina. The retina is the part of your eye that allows light to enter your body so that you can see and know where you're going. The reason that retina scanning is so popular is because your retina has 256 unique characteristics, while the other form of identification, your uh, your fingerprints, has 40 I had a friend of mine who had a detached retina one time, and there were two options that he had to fix it. One, injecting liquid into it to kind of help reshape the eye. And for a while, he'd have a a bubble in his eye that he had to wait and let that dissipate. Or they could put a rubber band around it to kind of hold it all together. Sorry. Still, in something that's complex, We can heal it, but there's still going to be a bubble that's eventually eventually going to go go away. But how does Jesus heal this complex organ? He touches it. Think of the power that Jesus has to touch and to heal. And Jesus touched these eyes, which it was more than just a detached retina. It was more than just a scratched cornea. They didn't work at all. And they were healed instantly. But yet there's more in the subtext than we get in the English translation. The word that's used there for healed means saved. And what we see happen in other contexts where that word is used is actually speaking to his spiritual salvation. So friends, not only were Bartimaeus' eyes healed, he was converted. He was fully transformed, as the text says, by his faith. He didn't pay Jesus for this healing. He didn't perform some kind of act. He put his faith and his hope in Jesus. And he says, this is my hope, not only for my blindness, but also to deal with my sin. 
And he put his faith in the only person who has the power to save. And when he does, he is converted, as we call it. That's what we call it when a person comes to faith in Christ. And they are taken from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It is conversion. And in this, we have a story of what it looks like to encounter Christ and be forgiven of sin. And while we may not have physical blindness, all people have a spiritual blindness that we cannot change. And the scary thing is, we're not even aware that we have it. Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians that we are blinded by Satan, who he calls the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds, have blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Without God, we are blinded by the evil one, unable to see God's glory. So friends, it is God who is the one who opens our eyes to our need for mercy and our need for the gospel. He is the one who heals our blindness and we see the need of the good news that Jesus has gone to the cross in our place and that we can be saved when we repent of sins and place our faith in him as we see Bartimaeus doing here. Bartimaeus has received the mercy of Christ to relieve him of his physical suffering. But more importantly, he's received mercy in a spiritual sense to relieve him of the spiritual suffering and prevent an eternity of being separated from God. But rather than return to the life of begging by the road, it says here that he got up and followed him. The Gospel of Luke says he followed him, bringing glory to Jesus. And friends, when we are changed and when our eyes are open to the newness of life in Christ, we don't go back to the life that we lived before. We walk a lifetime of discipleship, a lifetime of sanctification, becoming more like Jesus step by small step. But yet even with that, we still have to be on guard against spiritual blindness. Let me explain what I mean. The Bible teaches that even though we are made new in Christ, we still battle sin as long as we are on this earth. And as we mature in Christ, that battle with sin is going to become easier as we become, as we become more and more sanctified. But it's never going to fully go away. Paul teaches us, teaches us this in the book of Romans. Hebrews 3 teaches us about lingering sin. And here's what happens when we deal with or, or fail to deal with lingering sin. When we entertain sin and when we kind of have these pet sins that we hang on to and we refuse to get rid of, then we risk a hardening of our hearts and we risk another type of spiritual blindness. When we entertain this sin, when we indulge in it, instead of battling it and killing it by the Holy Spirit, listen to how Peter warns us in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, chapter five, or, uh, 1, verse 5 says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. Now, notice what he says here. He says, supplement your faith. So the things that he's getting ready to say, he's not saying these are the things that are going to save you. He's saying these are the things that you're going to do because you are saved. And as you do these things, your faith will be strengthened and your battle with sin will become easier. I didn't say easy, but easier. Verse six, and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins." So the person that Peter is describing here is the follower of Christ who has gotten comfortable with sin and ignores the good actions we should do after we are saved. He's begun to ignore his or her conscience. When things tell him, hey, what you're doing is against what God has told you to do. If we, if we begin to ignore that conscience and it becomes seared, then we find ourselves in a very dangerous place. We begin to excuse whatever sin it is in a way that makes it sound like we're justified in feeling the way we do when we sin. Instead of repenting of these sins, we give them room to grow in our hearts and in our lives, convincing ourselves, I deserve to indulge in this once in a while. I deserve to feel how I feel when I do this. 
And as this goes on, little by little, Peter's telling us, you will become blind. We're not losing our salvation, but our heart is getting harder as we have forgotten the sins that we've been cleansed from. We become forgetful, Peter says, and we begin to develop these blind spots where there are these areas of sin in our lives that we don't even notice anymore. And as our hearts grow harder, we become prideful and we lose any effectiveness in the kingdom of God. But friends, here's the good news. If we belong to God, he will discipline us. And he will convict us of sin and bring us back to him. Now, the farther we've walked, the harder the process is going to be. The farther we've walked, the harder repentance is going to be. But it is always possible. And God, in his mercy, disciplines us when we need it. And in his mercy, he draws us back to himself. Where we can be sure of that when he's doing that, he is waiting there to forgive and not to condemn if we are in him. That's why our understanding and our experience and our need for the mercy of God does not go away when we are converted. It's something that we continue to need in our walks with Christ while we are here on this earth. That's why it's important for us to be in a local church, to be active in the body of Christ so that we have trusted brothers and sisters in Christ who can point out our blind spots so that we can repent and be restored. So how should we then live? I ask you this question. How are you imitating Christ and Bartimaeus? One of the ways that we we apply scripture is we look at the example of someone who is in the text. Is there an example for us to follow? We have two examples here. First one I want us to look at is Bartimaeus. The first thing and the first thing we have to do is admit that you need to be healed of spiritual blindness and cry out for God's mercy and salvation. Friends, all of us before coming to Christ are spiritually blind. We're blinded by the deceptions of sin and blinded by the evil one. And if you are not in Christ, if you are still spiritually blind, then friend, I tell you today, cry out for the Lord's mercy. Cry out for his healing. Cry out for him to remove the blinders so that you could see the glory of Christ and see the glory of his saving grace in the gospel. For those of us who are in Christ, following the example of Bartimaeus means being persistent and praying, being persistent in asking God for the things that we need. Bartimaeus was persistent in asking for mercy several times, even after the crowd tells him, look, man, be quiet. We often give up praying for something when it doesn't happen as quickly as we would like. Jesus commands us to be persistent, even giving us a parable of a persistent widow who goes to a judge day after day asking for justice to where the judge finally says, look, I'm going to give you what you want so you can just leave me alone. How much better is it that there's a king who loves us and wants to give us what we need and wants to hear from us, not to get rid of us, but because it's what he wants to do. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians to pray without ceasing So let's be persistent in praying, even when things don't come right away. Be persistent in praying for healing when it doesn't come as quickly as we'd like. Be persistent in praying for the salvation of one who seems to have the hardest of hearts toward God, who seems like they're beyond redemption. Friends, if we believe that God can redeem anyone, then we must continue to pray for those who seem especially far from God. Do not grow weary and persist in praying. And we must fight and pray to maintain the joy of our salvation. We see the joy of the salvation of Bartimaeus who joyfully goes after and following Jesus. One of the ways that we we hold on to the joy is by mortifying and killing our sin. Pray for God to restore your joy and salvation as David does in Psalm 51. Remind yourself that your position in God is based on his grace and his mercy and not in your feelings. And be encouraged by that. Let that bring you joy in your salvation. Remember that no matter what gets taken away from you, nothing changes the position that you have in God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways you maintain this joy is by not neglecting the gift that we have been given, as I mentioned just a minute ago, in Christian community, where we receive the encouragement and the prayer we need to persevere in faith and in joy. 
So in what ways do we need to imitate Jesus? One, show mercy to those whom you can. All of us will experience the pain and the anger of being sinned against and being wronged. And we may find ourselves in the position of holding something over another person because of their sin. But here's what Paul says in Romans, that God's kindness leads us to repentance. And if God's kindness leads us to repentance, then our mercy and our kindness toward others will eventually lead them to repentance. Now, that does not mean there aren't consequences for our sin, even when we sin against other people. And maybe in relationships, we need to create boundaries. We'll have to use wisdom in how we show mercy. Parents, there should be times when we show mercy, but there are consequences. It should be consequences when our kids disobey. But yet there are times where we need to show mercy. Be aware of those as Jesus was aware of Bartimaeus' needs, be aware of the needs of other people that we may be able to meet. We need to be in each other's lives so that we know each other's needs. And if we aren't in position, we should be willing to meet those. Now, it's easy to meet the needs of others out of our abundance. I'm not going to use this anyway, so you can just have it. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus met our needs in sacrifice. And that's what we need to be willing to do. We won't always be called to do that, that that's a willingness in the spirit by which we need to approach each other. Friends, Jesus' whole life was lived in sacrifice. So let's imitate him in serving and meeting each other's needs. Friends, God has shown us grace and he has shown us mercy. And the question that we, the way we need to answer Jesus when he asks us, what is it you want me to do for you? The ultimate answer is we need mercy and we need your grace. So let's live our lives in gratitude for what Christ has done for us. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks and we give you praise. We admit and we confess that we are nothing without the grace and the mercy that you have shown us. And Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus and through him, God, we thank you that we're able to experience those things. Lord, we pray that we would not take it for granted, that we would always live our lives and walking in gratitude from what you have saved us from and what you have created us to be. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.